Hughes and some new names and being new recorded names today um, to celebrate Holly's work. Um, I'm here just as uh, a past president of the Society of Fellows in Critical Bibliography uh, to introduce our guest speakers today and to get the ball rolling. Um, we'll have a conversation between Holly Borum and Aaron Hyman, followed by some chat and discussion towards the end, which I'll also help to moderate. Um, as we're going through the conversation between Holly and Aaron, feel free to pop questions up in the chat um, or to hold them for later in the discussion, and I'll draw your questions out into the conversation in the last quarter of the hour. Um, just to kick us off and to do a bit of introduction, um, today's uh, discussion is celebrating the publication of Holly Borum's book, The Circulating Lifeblood of Ideas, Leo Steinberg's Library of Prints, which came out in just 2023, so just this year. Holly is the Associate Curator of Prints, Drawings, and European Art at the Blanton Museum of Art at the University of Texas at Austin. In addition to her major exhibition on the Leo Steinberg Collection, which forms the core of the Blanton's early modern print holdings, Holly has curated copies, fakes, and reproductions, printmaking in the Renaissance, and fantastically French, I love that title, design and architecture in 16th to 18th century prints, among many other shows. Um, she'll be in conversation today with Aaron Hyman, who is also a senior fellow in the Society of Fellows in Critical Bibliography. Um, he is an assistant professor in the Department of History of Art at Johns Hopkins University and author of another book with a fantastic title, Rubens in Repeat, The Logic of the Copy in Colonial Latin America, which was awarded the best book in Colonial Latin American Studies, published from 2019 to 2022 by the Latin American Studies Association. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Holly, who tells us a little bit about our book, and she and Erin will be in conversation with each other. So passing it, the baton, over to you. Well, thank you so much, everybody. It's a delight to, to be here today. Um, and thank you so much for that introduction, Beth. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Erin for taking part in the program today. And thank you to Beth, who is the original mastermind behind these book parties. Uh, she started the series during the pandemic as a way to feature the great work of our society. And I'm very grateful that she graciously returned today to be our moderator, um, a role that I normally take. And um, so glad to have you back, Beth. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start screen sharing. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, okay, so today I'll be talking about Leo Steinberg and his print collection, and I'm just going to give kind of a quick overview to set the stage of who is Leo Steinberg, what is this print collection about, and then Aaron and I will be in conversation with each other further about it. So um, over the years that Leo Steinberg was um, collecting, maneuver all of these buttons here. Um, Sorry, advance. There we go. Um, here's Leo Steinberg. Um, over the years that he was collecting, he bought, sold, and traded over 6,000 prints. Approximately 3,500 of those are now at the Blanton Museum. And this collection was the basis of an exhibition and the accompanying catalog that we'll be talking about today. Um, so who is Leo Steinberg? Um, in short, he was one of the most important art historians of the 20th century. And here is an array of his publications. The breadth of his scholarship is really remarkable. Um, in other criteria, he coins the term postmodernist to describe the work of artists he, he encountered in New York in the 1950s and 60s. Um, his book on the sexuality of Christ in Renaissance art and in modern oblivion was highly controversial when it appeared in the 80s, though by now his insights there have largely been accepted as a matter of course by art historians. He is equally well known for his scholarship on the early modern period, addressing such luminaries as Leonardo and Michelangelo. His writings on Picasso shaped that field of study. And across the bottom of the screen, you can see the five recent volumes of his important essays and lectures, many of which have not been previously published. Steinberg's contributions to the field of art history are widely acknowledged. The fact that he had a remarkable print collection, however, is less well known. And to understand that collection, it's important to touch briefly on his personal history. Steinberg did not come from a family that collected art. And in fact, his early years were shaped by the tragedies and sufferings of the major conflicts of the 20th century. Steinberg was born in 1920 in the Soviet Union. 
into an educated Jewish family. Uh, for political reasons, the family went into exile in Berlin in 1923. They stayed there in Germany for 10 years, um, thankfully escaping in 1933, however, as Hitler came to power. Um, shortly before the family left Germany, Leo had a pivotal experience that I think will be particularly poignant for all of us bibliophiles and critical bibliographers. Uh, in 1932, Leo visited a socialist bookstore with his parents, and he describes being captivated by this particular book on early Renaissance Italian paintings. The store owner recognized the 12-year-old's fascination and gave the book to Leo, because his parents couldn't afford to buy it and because he knew that Hitler would be closing his store imminently. This book is now among Steinberg's papers at the Getty Research Institute and is inscribed to Hanukkah for Hanukkah, 1932. Steinberg also witnessed a book in Berlin. And it's amazing to think about the impression that that would make on a person who would then go on to win an award in literature from the American Academy for Arts and Letters. Thankfully, the family escaped to London in 1933, and Steinberg had to start over again, learning English as a teenager. He went on to study at the Slade School of Art from 1936 to 1940, where he focused on sculpture and life drawing, winning prizes for both. And there we see him in the front row. After wartime service, he emigrated to New York, where he taught life drawing classes at Parsons and began lecturing at the 92nd Street Y. That led him back to further study, and he eventually earned a PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts with a dissertation on the Baroque architect Borromini. Then our story takes another dramatic turn. Shortly after graduation, and before he was able to begin his teaching career at Hunter College in the fall, he had a heart attack at age 40. Those of us in academia might be particularly sympathetic to this person who went back later in life to earn a PhD and was poised for his first teaching position and then literally had a heart attack. The doctor told him to take it easy that summer, um, which for Steinberg meant no long hours in the library, drafting articles on his typewriter, but instead traipsing around New York's print dealers looking for works of art. He had previously bought a few prints before his heart attack and even ordered from a catalog sight unseen while in his hospital bed, but his collecting only began in earnest that spring of 1960. Steinberg kept meticulous notes of his purchases in a series of spiral bound notebooks. This is the one nicer ledger um, that he had. Um, he was nothing if not economical. Um, we can see that for each print, he lists the artist and title, the month and year of purchase, the price, the dealer or source. And then on the second page, he keeps notes about each work. This could include the catalog raisonne number, else um, another place where he's seen it for sale, subsequent prices for that print. Um, a red line means that he traded or sold the work before it came to the Blanton in, in 2002. Um, you'll notice that at the bottom, he keeps tallies of how much he's spent, and he periodically separately lists um, a list, makes a list of winners and losers based on the changes in price over time. And if we want to take a look at the number, at the column there with the numbers, we can appreciate he is paying $1.50 for a print by Martin DeVos. <laughs> um, he's paying $1.50 for works by Jakob Mathen and Egidius Sadler. Kind of incredible prices for us. Um, though keep in mind at the same time, he's earning $6,000 a year as a part-time instructor, um, college instructor. He's buying from New York dealers. Um, and in the summers, he goes to London and Paris and frequents a range of dealers there. Um, he describes making raids on those cities, bringing home 600 prints at a time. What is he buying? Um, in general, he's buying what we might call fine art prints. He's not buying maps or botanical prints or ephemera. Uh, there's a raid from the early days of making up through the 19th century. Um, and with his trained artistic eye, he's looking for high quality works in at least decent condition that he can afford. But he's not bothered at all by not knowing the names of artists. And in fact, I think he really delights in discovering wonderful works by artists he never encountered in graduate school. Um, he cannot, by and large, afford the big names like Rembrandt and Durer, um, though he will collect some works by them later as his budget expands. And as these pie charts show, his collecting reflects the relative size of the various European print centers in the early modern period. 
And because it's much more fun to look at art than pie charts, I'm gonna show you some of his earliest prints here. Um, he's not collecting, and just another observation, he's not collecting a lot from his contemporaries. He's not buying artworks um, from New York artists of the 50s and 60s. Um, his collection does reflect his interest in Renaissance and Baroque periods, but it extends far beyond that. Um, so he's not actually writing much about Netherlandish printmakers. He's not really writing much about 17th century French artists, but those do make up a large part of his collection. In looking at these thousands and thousands of prints, as he's rifling through bins in the basements of print shops, he realizes that prints are what he will call the circulating lifeblood of ideas. Um, prints disseminated compositions, motifs, and themes across Europe and beyond. And in the exhibition, there was a section called Used Prints, where we displayed works that show the physical marks of their utility in the artist's studio. So for example, um, this print here, we're displayed it with the backside forward. Um, so on the other side of this work, there is a black and white print and on the side facing us, there's a red chalk drawing. So likely the artist held this print up to a window or another light source and traced several figures in red chalk on the verso. Then he could, the artist could dampen the red chalk and press another sheet of paper against it to transfer the figures to a new sheet. Um, and then um, the figures then that he's transferred would be facing the same way as the figures on the very front of the print. And then he could start a whole new composition. So there's a variety of ways to transfer figures and to copy and trace. That's one of them. Um, also, um, this print over here, um, you'd have to hold a light source behind it, but you can see that there's tiny holes pricked in it. And that's another method of transfer called pricked for transfer. Um, and then inset here, I've included another work that we displayed that shows a work that was squared for transfer. Um, so even when Steinberg couldn't find physical evidence of these borrowings on his prints, he could still follow similar chains of transmission. So for example, he noticed this Courier and Ives lithograph on the far left here splices together the top half of this deposition that's in the middle, minus perhaps an extraneous figure on the latter, splices it together with the bottom half of this print, sorry, that's on the right. Um, why did Courier and Ives perform this cut and paste operation? Steinberg postulates that the image of the Virgin in this middle image here with parted legs, symbolically in labor, giving birth to the church was perhaps too much for an American audience. Um, so Courier and Ives imported a more decorous bottom half there um, and put the Virgin further in the background. One last point before I wrap up this quick overview uh, is about the status and nature of copies. In Steinberg's day for a Renaissance art historian to deign to look at a Courier and Ives print was somewhat laughable, um, but Steinberg really valorized copies and developed a very fruitful methodology of comparing printed copies to famous originals in order to learn something both about the original and the context of the copy. And I think we may get further into this in a few minutes, um, but I think it's an important point as critical bibliographers to think about Steinberg making a really interesting contribution to our understanding of the value of copies. It's not all about the first folio. <laughs> it's about what comes after that as well. And then finally, I'll just wrap up um, this intro with a table of contents of the catalog. Uh, the first essay goes in further into detail about Steinberg's biography and the growth of his collection. The second looks at the full range of Steinberg's scholarship and demonstrates how his print collection furnished further essential evidence for his scholarly arguments. Peter Parshall contributed a brilliant essay considering Steinberg's collecting and his use of the metaphor of the flatbed press for the flatbed picture plane in relation to the art of Robert Rauschenberg. And in the final essay, I give an overview of the Steinberg collection in 52 objects from the turn of the 15th century through the 1960s. It's not written as a series of catalog entries per se, but rather as a continuous narrative tracing the development of print history through these selected highlights of Western printmaking. So I'm gonna stop sharing there and um, hopefully that's given you um, a good overview of the project. And I look forward to um, talking further with Aaron and the rest of you about this. Hey, Holly. Um, 
Thanks for the overview of the book. And I should just say to everyone, um, you know, these events in some way give us an overview of the book and it can be tempting to sort of be like, oh yeah, I know what that's about. This is just such a delightful text to read. And I know we talked about this briefly, but writing about Steinberg is, is probably very difficult and sounds like it was very difficult because he himself is such a good writer. But I just urge everyone to really pick up a copy of this book because it's just delightful. There's these like witty turns of phrase and witty little ideas that you think, oh, I'm I'm almost at the end of this like, concluding paragraph. And then it's just like something so sparkling. So um, the writing is exceptional and it's the kind of book you should just curl up with. Um, in terms of the content, I was wondering how like, you know, we saw this great picture of Steinberg in the front row and you, you mentioned that he's um, enrolled at Slate School, but I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about um, his practice as an artist, his training as an artist, um, and how that kind of conditions his collecting practice, how you see that conditioning his collecting practice. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think that it really is fundamental um, to understanding, it's, it's fundamental to understanding him as a scholar and as a collector. So um, I am going to show you a few more um, images here because um, it doesn't make sense to talk about him as an artist without showing you some of his um some of his works. Um, sorry, you know what, let me, those are some of his prints, but let's, here we go. Mm -hmm. um, so he was a sculptor and um, a draftsman. Um, and so the Slade School was relatively conservative. I mean, it, it was a pretty steady diet of life drawing. Um, and so um, he is incredibly attuned to pose and gesture. Um, here's mm -hmm. another, uh, some other, other of his drawings. So you can see how he was trained. Um, and I think this, it's fundamental to really understanding his scholarship and his collecting in, in many ways. One is that he is always on the side of the artist and he always takes the artist's perspective first. Um, and so when he is an artist, in his role as an art historian, um, he really pushes against um, interpretations that rely on texts and that say, well, you know, Alberti says artists should do X. Um, and therefore, when we look at Renaissance paintings, we're going to apply Albertian principles and interpret paintings that way. He says, no artist sits down and reads, what am I supposed to paint? And therefore I paint it, um, which again, might, which might seem like a very basic point, but I think as an art historian myself, who was not trained as an artist, it's easy to go to the text and then try to apply it back to a picture. Whereas Steinberg's always starting from this place of deep sympathy and understanding of, I too was staring at a sheet of blank paper or had a lump of clay and had to figure out how to match what was in my head and what I was seeing mm -hmm. and produce it on a piece of paper. And so mm -hmm. he's deeply sympathetic about that process that comes into how he interprets artwork for sure. Um, again, not relying primarily on text. He's incredibly attuned to posture and body language, um, which is one of the reasons that he got into that whole um, uh, kind of kettle of fish <laughs> um, with the sexuality of Christ, um, where he notices and says, hey, artists are painting Christ's genitals. Why is nobody noticing this? And when you get to, when you're an artist, you don't just skip over a middle part of somebody's body. You either decide to cover it or not cover it. Um, and a written description could sort of talk about Christ's body and not mention it, but an artist is going to have to make a decision. And so he's always relying on visual evidence first. It doesn't mean he doesn't look at text. I mean, in that book, The Sexuality of Christ, he does look at sermon text and what is being said about Christ's humanity. And that then affects kind of where he goes. Um, that does help bolster his argument, but he starts with, the visual. And um, I think it sets up a very kind of democratic way of doing art mm -hmm. history because anybody can look and see balanced, however, with the fact that he looked and looked and looked and looked at so many images. It's not a very casual thing. It's not a, oh, I just saw that and therefore I'm spinning off this interpretation. Um, he tells an anecdote about a student who was um, in a class of his and somebody asked a question about a pose. I, I don't remember what the question was, but it was something like, oh, well, I've noticed that, you know, a finger is pointing that way. What does that mean? And Steinberg said, well, we'd need to always look at the instance. And in that set, in that theme, how often is a finger pointing that way? How often is it pointing a different way? And it's almost sort of a scientific approach. Um, and 
uh, the student who had been sitting in a lecture came up to him afterwards, like, oh man, I really respect art historians now. I thought you just sort of made stuff up, but like this, there's a scientific basis to this. So I think his training as an artist made, and doing all these life drawings made him very attuned to posture, body language, pose. Like I said, puts him on the side of the artist um, versus the critic, um, though he certainly is a critic, but he's, um, and it also, in one other way, um, he, because again, the way that artists historically have trained is by copying other artists um, in the Renaissance. And so knowing that when you make a copy, he says that copyists look and examine an artwork inch by inch, and they don't, um, again, when you're writing about it, you could skip over a troubling passage, but an artist has to figure out what is going on in this troubling passage. And when an artist makes an adjustment, that's a really interesting point of tension that we should discuss and look at and interrogate. Um, and so in a sense, artists are doing kind of difficult research work for us. And if we just pay attention to these copies, that will be revealing for us. So yeah, I think his artistic practice really is fundamental to um, his. <laughs> and one other way to answer that question too, is I think it really gave him an appreciation for the technical proficiency of printmakers at a time when maybe that was out of fashion, when abstract expressionism um, mm -hmm. was kind of the flavor of the day. And to look back at these 17th century French printmakers that are doing such precise, beautiful line work, he could really appreciate that and say, there is something wonderful about technical virtuosity yeah. and we love that. And I'm an artist and I appreciate that. <laughs> God, I have, okay. So two things come up for me immediately. One is that's really interesting about the figural dimension of the training at Slade, like this very conservative pose, uh, motif, uh, life drawing kind of world that he's inculcated in. You know, the vast majority of the, of the figures in this book, by which I mean the reproductions of his prints are figural uh, compositions. That is kind mm -hmm. of history paintings, reproductions of history paintings, um, you know, inventions in their own right in print, but still around the figure. Is that, by dint of the way that you're putting them into dialogue with his scholarship, or is that true of the broader collection? I hadn't I hadn't really thought about that until you were answering that question. Yeah, I think his collection, um, so, I mean, when would abstraction enter in? It would be 20th century, and he's not really collecting 20th century objects. Um, but is he collecting like, um, like land I'm thinking a lot of like the northern the northern traditions of landscape etchings and like these kinds of genre genre scenes as opposed mm -hmm. to okay. um, narrative scenes and figure-based scenes well he does have he does have a lot of landscapes um mm. uh he, I mean he's got a lot of like Vaterlo, you know like little <laughs> kind of ones that are a little hard to put in an exhibition you know I mean they're, yeah. they're interesting historically um I do think he yeah I think he really primarily is interested in yeah. the figure. I mean, when you look at his work yeah. on Michelangelo, I mean, he's just captivated by that, but he's yeah. not uninterested in others. He doesn't have lots and lots of landscapes, but um, a really interesting strain that I thought was fascinating was his um, collections of animal prints. Because when you start really looking at his series of animal prints, they adopt very human poses or more sort of like low class human poses that humans might not adopt, but they're very expressive. So I think yeah. he's always looking at how the figure expresses itself. Um, there's not a lot of, there's some ornament prints, but there's not a lot of ornament prints. So yeah. um, not a lot of architectural prints. I think he wanted to have a, some range. So there is oh. some you know, Vendel Dieterlin, but those are, yeah. those are architectural prints that do often have lots of figures in them. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think the human body um, and I do think he was drawn to artists, you know, like Picasso, where the human body is incredibly expressive as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, really interesting. I mean, I guess that's sort of, um, segues into another thing I was hoping you could talk a little bit about, which is, you know, you lay out a number of these case studies that speak to the way that Steinberg is assembling these prints, um, so as to produce new interpretations of canonical works of art. And I'm thinking here specifically of his arguments around Leonardo's Last Supper or Michelangelo's Last Judgment. And can you just sort of walk us through maybe one or two of those examples um, to show the role that print played for him in assembling those, um, yeah. in assembling those arguments? 
Yes, absolutely. So um, let's, let's see, let's look at the Last Supper. Um, and this is a really, um, this is just a fabulous example, right? Because Leo Steinberg is incredibly complex. And so when he looks at this artwork, what he's ultimately going to conclude, I mean, he, he, there's seven chapters, there's seven approaches or seven chapters. Leonardo's doing literally seven different things in this artwork um, that we kind of think we know, but on the other hand, we don't because it deteriorated and there's so many questions about what was originally there. But um, I think... So this is Steinberg's last sort of major publication, and he's looked at this for a really long time and thought a lot about it. And he takes an unusual methodology in that um, he looks at, takes very seriously 49 copies after this artwork. And, you know, are you going to, is any copy going to be better than Leonardo's original? Why are you bothering looking at copies? Would have kind of been the very traditional way of thinking about this. Um, oops, maybe you want to look at a copy because there was a doorway cut through this fresco and it's deteriorated, but we're only going to be looking at the earliest copies because hopefully they'd be the closest to the original and that would give us some information. But Steinberg's saying there's so much going on in this painting and he, um, he uses copies to help him kind of excavate and peel back all the different layers of what, of what, um, Leonardo had, um, put into this work. So, um, I don't have a reproduction of it here, but he begins by looking at the very first earliest copy of this work in print. And he says, it's not a very good copy. It's kind of ugly. Um, but it tells us something very important because first of all, this is this is probably the first work that was immediately copied in print. So it sets off this dynamic of, um, or it's one of the very earliest paintings that was immediately reproduced in print. So it's this is how images are starting to get shared throughout Europe because most people are not, most artists are not going to go to this refectory in Milan. How do they find out what it looks like? Um, but within Steinberg's collection, he assembles a group of copies. Um, and I'll just kind of walk you through two of them. So when we look at Leonardo's painting at the top, um, and then we'll look in more detail at these two on the bottom. So um, it's the Last Supper, <laughs> uh, Christ is in the middle. He's with his 12 disciples. There's food on the table. And Steinberg begins with the question of what actually is happening? We think we know what's happening, but what actually is happening? What moment is being portrayed here? Um, is it the moment when Christ says, one of you will betray me? Is it the seconds after that? Is it when Christ says, you're going to eat my body and drink my blood, which is also an equally disturbing statement? <laughs> and are they reacting to that? Um, so when we look at this copy by Raphael Morgan, um, Steinberg notices, okay, under Christ's hand in the fresco, there is a glass of wine. And under Christ's hand in Raphael Morgan's version, there is no glass of wine there. And Morgan um, affixes a text at the bottom um, that says, one of you will betray me in Latin. Okay. So he is fixing a very specific meaning. He's saying this moment is one of you will betray me. And I'm taking away the wine glass because this doesn't actually have to do with the Eucharist. Um, in um, Rubin's version, which was um, etched here by Soutman, now Steinberg's taught us to look at this differently. Oh, what's missing? All the food on the table, all the cluttering dinner party food. There's a very clear glass and a very clear piece of bread. This is about the Eucharist and the verses underneath are saying, um, you know, explain the institution of the Eucharist, the beginning of communion there. Um, Steinberg also one of his arguments about um, the significance of this fresco is that um, it very purposely continues the space of the refectory. So um, the architecture behind Christ and the disciples um, visually would continue the space. So it's um, setting that scene specifically in the dining hall there um, so that uh, the, you know, the monks there would feel that Christ was among them. And um, Rubens and Soutman know, well, this isn't, this is no longer in that space. So we can change the background. We're just gonna get this much more dramatic um, curtain, but we, we don't need those sort of distracting windows and whatever's tapestries maybe on the walls. There's confusion about that too. So what Steinberg ultimately concludes is some people think it's about the Eucharist. Some people think it's about the betrayal. Um, and they, they distill it down to these individual separate meanings, but um, Leonardo is putting all of that in there. It's all of those moments, which makes sense when we consider sort of the 
the broader theological point, Christ is God and man. Um, there are all these coincident opposites is what he calls it. Coincident opposites that happen in Christ's life um, and that are in this work. So all of these different moments distilled or kind of coincidentally happening here. So that's super helpful. I mean, you know, one of the things that I had imagined I was looking for in Steinberg and his interest in prints coming from an artistic background was that he was going to be so invested in the kind of technique of print. Um, and that's not totally the story we get. I mean, he obviously is, he has a lot of admiration for print as a medium. And we sense that in some of his kind of print specific writing or kind of later reflections about his collecting practice or later reflections about print that he's asked to give. But in the scholarship itself, Mm -hmm. line work is not playing a role there, right? It's about figure and gesture and changes motif and changes to iconography that happen through the body. And I was feeling like there was this disconnect between his practice as an artist and his practice as a scholar because of that. But mm -hmm. actually the way that you've laid out that trajectory shows that as a kind of unified story. I mean, that the slave training was really about figure, about gesture, about studying the body um, through life yeah. drawing makes the practice with prints and makes the kind of way that he's building arguments through figural motif changes, hands facing in one direction, the things that bodies do in space, feel like a more unified project. Like I was feeling a disconnect, but it doesn't seem like there is one in your accounting. Yeah, and I think, you know, um... I think he made a lithograph or something in what, <laughs> you know, earlier. So he, he was not a printmaker, but he definitely, there's a, there's a fabulous, um, there's a fabulous uh, essay um, called What I Like About Prince by Steinberg that was actually based on a lecture that he gave at UT when the collection came to us. And there, that's where we hear him get to talk, that's where we get to hear him talk about um, his appreciation for line work. Um, and so he, let's see, I don't know if I have, um, I don't know. There's that I amazing have. quote that you have about, he's basically like they reveal themselves on a kind of anatomical le level because of the indexical nature of print. You can sort of reverse engineer from the impression itself what had happened on the, on the matrix, which is, so the sort of kind of seductive, nerdy, printy language <laughs> that <laughs> doesn't show up in the scholarship in the same way, right? There it's about composition, there it's about yeah. figures. There, it's about these kinds of iconographic registers of meaning. Yeah. So he, um, sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how to show you this one. <laughs> um, yeah. So this was a juxtaposition that we had in the show where he talks about, um, so yeah, if you're, <laughs> if anybody's familiar and uh, you can't get in close enough for this one, this one on the bottom right is an, just a an, magical feat of printmaking where the artist starts a spiral and it's just a single line that creates this um, mesmerizing holy face of Christ. And there's so much that can be said about that, about that particular work. Um, he talks about in that essay about um, an artist like Goltzius, who is plowing the field um, of the copper plate with this regularity and creating these um, these systems, the syntax of, of printmaking. Um, and then he compares that to someone like Roy Lichtenstein, who distills it down, you know, to dots and Chuck Close, who's, you know, kind of using rubber stamps. So I think, um, again, to, back to that very first question, because he's an, he's an artist, I think that also just gave him the confidence to approach art from every different period. <laughs> um, most of us are afraid to kind of go out of our decade or out of our century or something, you know, but he's, um, he can appreciate that and he can see the ways that artists looked back at previous artists um, and distilled, drew from, um, and yeah. So he's, he's not a, he's not a prince, you know, I kind of started, is he a prince scholar? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because he doesn't spend a lot of time talking about the different states of prince and the tiny different minutia. But when you read his, if you do, you know, when you look at his ledgers, he does have little notes in there, like, was this reinforced with dry point? And I think he had those conversations, but I don't think he spent a lot of time writing about that in a scholarly, you know, in a scholarly forum. Um, yeah. But it was because he cared about the value of his prints, he did want to know if he had a first state or a second state or something, but it it wasn't just to understand was this a first or second state, but um, I think it was always part of a bigger argument. Yeah, like most collectors, he wanted to know what he had, but it wasn't necessarily yeah. then inflecting the, <laughs> the scholarly argumentation. I mean, I guess that, that, kind of relates to another thing I've been thinking about in reading the book because you know this one of the central claims of this is that 
the collection is a library of prints um, and that it inflects his scholarship because he is able to look to this repository of motifs and things. Um, and that's sort of like a driving force of what happens in the book as you lay it out. Some of the most totally like, delightful vignettes in this book are him kind of rummaging through these vast storehouses of material, being locked in a mm -hmm. in a room at a dealer's, and the dealer comes back eight hours later, and he's you know culled from these like stacks and stacks of things, six things that he wants to buy or a hundred things that he wants to buy. Um, and I sort of wonder about just that broader practice of looking at everything. And you've sort of gotten to this, like it didn't matter if it was Courier and Ives circa 1800, or if it was, you know, the first time that The Last Summer had ever been copied in print, um, he was gonna take both of those seriously. But I'm wondering sort of like more broadly, if you could talk about just like that amount of looking mm -hmm. and how it, you've sort of gotten at how it registers, but what sort of model does it provide for us? I mean, we're not gonna go rummaging around stacks of um, prints in a dealer because that those opportunities don't exist for us in the same way so I'm just wondering like how we, exactly how we learn from this some of those things are kind of obvious in what you've laid out to value mm -hmm. the copy and to value things outside our own period and to look expansively um, and to take seriously the choices that artists make and to look past kind of the hierarchies of um valuation that are inherited from you know previous decades of scholarship but beyond that you've you know, learned all the right lessons Aaron <laughs> <laughs> I hope I can put all of those into practice myself but yeah you you nailed it <laughs> you know it's sort of like that's all that all in a certain way registers without thinking of I mean it, it is reinforced by thinking about the sheer amount of looking he did, um, how he gets there. But we could sort of read the scholarship and get there to a certain extent. So I wonder just like having spent so much time thinking about his obsession, his collecting, his purchasing, like what does that, how does that change things for us? Um, yeah, I mean, it is, one way that I've thought about that, and I mean, one way to maybe qualify that too, though, is we do, how many, we have access to different images in a different way because yeah. when he was first starting out, you know, catalog raisonnés of a lot of these print artists had not been published, you know, so you did have to physically go and look in person. Um, yeah. And he would, he didn't have an iPhone to take a picture. If he saw something, he would like, he would sketch it, which probably had like a very good discipline in terms of like embedding it in your mind. Um, and he would clip things out of newspapers and now we can pull up so much more. Mm -hmm. And You know, I do have to say, I, I've definitely benefited from that. Like finding, you know, museum or, you know, a graphic portal or collections that have put all of their works online. You are, we're able to find obscure things that Steinberg would have <laughs> he may have found in basements. Um, it's still somewhat serendipitous for us as for him, um, because things are not necessarily cataloged by the right artist or by the right title or by something that we're looking for. So I think, um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's interesting to consider who has access to more images. Did he yeah. or did, <laughs> did we? Do we now? I mean, I feel like in a way we must because of the internet, but his... Um, he was such a voracious looker um, and he, I glancingly mentioned um, that his papers are at the GRI and they're among them, um, you know, they're categorized uh, these little note cards and scraps by um, bodily postures, for example, like, yeah. like long leg, chin chuck. And they'll be, um, you know, obviously over the years, as he came across something, he clipped it out and would stick it in there. Um, or would draw something or pull something from an auction catalog and cut it out or whatever. So I think um, it was a a long, slow process of building mm -hmm. something up. And some of those files are very robust. And I think some, you know, decided, okay, this gesture doesn't, isn't that meaningful. Or I didn't find that much about, you know, yeah. towards this particular pose. Um, I do think it's a challenge as an art historian to figure out how do you store your images? And yeah. <laughs> you know, you, yeah, yeah. you have good systems for that. We've talked about it. I feel like I'm a little yeah. bit scattered of like, oh, I took a picture here and how do I save all of that? So I think it is, it's a different, it's a different kind of, it's, there's different parameters to the challenges that we face. Um, yeah, but I had really been thinking about that question. You sort of said, 
who has more access like him or us. And I was thinking about that in terms of, you know, there were certain structural parameters that he was contending with, right? He didn't have catalog raisonnés that were super simple to buy. He had no internet, but what he did have was this like vast storeroom, which meant already in those stacks, high and low in terms of quality were mixed in together, yeah. right? He was sort of going through things without any presupposition about what mattered and what didn't in a certain way, because it was all mixed together. He had to wade through it. And I don't know, I mean, you know, in my own work with Ruben's reproductive prints, mm -hmm because I was working on Rubens and not say Rembrandt, people, after I came, you know, a couple of times to a print room, they'd say, oh, you can go through the box yourself. You know, like it wasn't like what print, what impression do you need, but just like turn through these things. And often they're like not mounted, like things are just piled on top of one another because it's like Rubens is a dime a dozen. Whereas if it were Rembrandt in the new world, which is let's <laughs> get rid of all the historical things in the world that would make that impossible. But if it were Rembrandt in a new world or Rembrandt in Latin America, then that wouldn't have been possible, right? Like I would have had to really be specific about the kinds of prints I wouldn't be rummaging through. So there is this way in which as collections catalog better and as we think about access from digitization, there are actually certain kinds of looking or certain types of practices that get walled off for us. And so I think it's interesting, not like, I, I think it's totally right to ask that question, who has more access, him or us, because the types of access are actually really different qualitatively in addition to the kind of issue of quantitative things that I think is apparent. Yeah. And I mean, he talked about, it's also this, this isn't done either is that you, he could go to a print shop, take works on approval right. um, and he would go to the Metropolitan Museum and, and talk to the curators there. What do I have? Can I compare it to yours? And now you would never be allowed to walk in with you know, some prints into the Metropolitan Museum study room because Absolutely. Yeah. for many reasons why, you know, but yet, that wouldn't happen. And so um, it is a different, it is a different world. I, I guess I don't have a complete answer to your question, but I think it does. It's interesting for us as scholars to think about what, um, what challenges or parameters was he faced with and what, what is, yeah, what are the pros and cons of, of what we have and is yeah. there any way to get around some of the things that maybe, as you said, are more walled off to us? Um, and just to be more mindful of like, what are the structural limitations and enablements? You know, like the iPhone on the one hand, we don't have to sketch it. On the other hand, sometimes you get all these incredible things like weird moiré effects where you're like, oh, I didn't look at line that way until my iPhone blew up when I tried to take a picture of Colsius, you know, like. Um, <laughs> yeah. I know we're running short on time and I want to I want to make sure we have a chance for questions, but I did want to give you a chance to talk about the second half of this book, which is super masterful for everyone. Um, it uses Steinberg's collection to write basically a history of Western printmaking, and it introduces readers to all the kinds of key terms, techniques, while walking them through the development of the medium in Europe over the course, really like from the get-go to the 20th century. Um, and I realized in reading it that Steinberg just didn't do that. <laughs> like he never wrote a, a medium specific history, even though he was so invested in print and he was so invested in collecting, he never produced a history of print itself, whether in the Renaissance, his area of study, or just more broadly or, or in modern art. So I sort of am wondering what it means for you to have done that historiographically, um, why he didn't, why you did, and why like we're in a moment where we can be excited about both of these things. <laughs> um, I guess for me, as I was doing it, you know, I, I was trying to, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why I felt like I, I wanted to tackle that and take it on. It would have been a little easier to just sort of write a couple of sentences about each of those prints and call it a, call it a day, but Indeed. a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> it was that it was a very, it was a very involved part of the process, but it was, you know, some, it's one of those things that you, you just learn so much by doing it. And then I'm like, okay, this makes sense. And really it was kind of guided by his concept of the circulating lifeblood of ideas that are these artists are passing a baton from one to another in a way. And I was trying to trace that and to tell a history. And in some cases, it's really clear. This artist traveled from here to here and this workshop picked up on it. Um, yeah. Sometimes there's bigger jumps, like meanwhile in France, um, but, um, and there's enough of a print culture going on that I, you know, you, I think you can make that kind of leap a little bit. So um I, you know, I don't think, um, yeah, what kind of scholar was Steinberg? I don't, I don't, he didn't write a general anything, you know, no, I mean, so I don't true. think that would have appealed to him. I think he saw the interconnectedness of all of these, 
he did write a few brilliant um, articles for uh, the print collector's newsletter that were very print focused, but it was always connected to a painting, to something else showing. So again, is he a print scholar? I don't think he would have put himself in that category in the way that we think of people. You're a print scholar or you're a painting or, or you're a sculpture person. Um, but for me, uh, I guess part of it was, it was an exercise I wanted to set for myself. Can I, yeah. there are connections. Can I elucidate them in a way that makes sense? And it, as I said, it is the circulating lifeblood of ideas. And this, I do believe that it is a legitimate connective tissue through European art history. And I was trying to, to show all of that. So, I mean, that seems like such a nice place to end it in a way, because it also forces us, even as we're kind of clinging to this undervalued medium and to this recondite knowledge that is, you know, potentially on the verge of extinction within these disciplines to also think like, oh, right, but don't reify that. Like, make sure it goes back into dialogue with all these other things from which it came. That seems like a nice, a nice wrapping up point for our little chat. <laughs> That's a nice summary. Thank you, Erin. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Holly, um, for such an illuminating discussion of such a fascinating uh, book and figure and collection, and to Aaron for posing such insightful questions. Um, we'd like to open up the conversation more broadly now in these last 10, 15 minutes. Um, if you have questions, if you have thoughts, uh, ideas to share, um, feel free to pop them in the chat, or if you want to use the raise hands function, um, I would be happy to call on folks as well. I was just so fascinated um, by the idea of every copy is also an interpretation. Um, and one of the things that struck me when you and, and Aaron were talking, Holly, was the fact that Steinberg himself was also making copies, right? That he would draw things um, that he wasn't sure he'd be able to get his hands on again. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about how he interpreted what he saw, um, because that discussion of the the Da Vinci Last Supper, right, was so illuminating of interpretive choices that people made in making copies of it. Yeah, I mean, he really puts copies, he gets a lot out of, he gets a lot of mileage out of looking at copies. Like, for example, in Copies After Michelangelo, um, I mean, he gets into Counter-Reformation theology, he's getting into, I mean, he reads... <laughs> Uh, in Michelangelo's Last Judgment, for example, and I'm afraid I don't have a, an image of that, he reads a whole bunch of different copies and he's arguing that Michelangelo actually is kind of heretical and believes that hell is not permanent. And he's looking at that, he sees this diagonal line that goes up from kind of the hell up through to heaven. Um, and then he says other copyists um, thought that understood what Michelangelo was doing, thought that was heretical and changed the proportion so that the diagonal was messed up. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so instead of being like, gosh, nobody can, nobody's as good as Michelangelo. Look at these, all, all of these like um, wonky copies. <laughs> he reads deep theological meaning into that. Um, so uh, his, his use of copies really is just uh, revolution. I mean, nobody else uses copies in that way. Nobody else looks at copies in that way. No one else um, yeah, kind of sees the, nobody else previously had seen kind of the evidence that they could provide, the value that they could provide. Um, so um, he also, Steinberg has this phrase, like, I don't trust an art historian who can't dance, meaning like, if you don't get up and move your body and try to take the form of the artwork you're looking at, you haven't really seen it, you haven't really embodied it. Um, and so he would have his students kind of mimic the poses of figures um, and to figure out, um, is she recoiling from him or is she leaning into him? What's going on there? Um, and so what do we think with our eyes versus what kind of embodied knowledge do you know, either as an artist who's tried to copy that or as a human body who has, you know, enacted that same pose? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Leslie in the chat has written, I'm curious to know how much or how little non-Western prints figured in Steinberg's library. <laughs> Hi, Leslie. Um, almost zero. <laughs> um, yeah, he didn't collect non-Western prints. Um, and um, he also di really didn't collect 20th century prints. Um, he, I think they were less useful for this kind of encyclopedia of body language that he was assembling. I know this isn't exactly your question, Leslie, but there's, you would think, 
if he wanted to make if he was wanted to make money, he would have collected prints by Robert Rauschenberg and all of these artists whom he valorized. I mean, he was the first person to write about Johns and Rauschenberg and defend them <laughs> against their critics. Um, so if he'd gone out and bought their prints, he would have been much wealthier. Um, but that's not really what he was doing with his print collection. Um, I think maybe he had one um, Japanese print. Um, and I hadn't really thought about why, but I, I, I suspect that it, again, was not as useful for his scholarship um, as, uh, you know, these early modern European prints were. Mm -hmm. mm. We have a question from Andalib. Um, congratulations, Holly. <laughs> My question is about the process of deciding which prints from Steinberg's collection came to the Blanton. Um, oh, okay. So Steinberg, um, yeah, so just to clarify, um, in looking at his ledgers um, and print purchases over the course of his life, about 6,000 prints passed through his hands at the most he ever had was about 4,500 prints. Um, and by the time the works, um, by the time he was ready to kind of have a plan for where his collection was going to go, it was closer to 3,200. Um, and so all of, almost all of those came to us. Um, I'll explain a little bit, a caveat, but, um, but before that, um, he had made yearly gifts to other institutions. So the New York Public Library has a really nice collection of his prints, um, over 200. If he gave a lecture somewhere, um, he might, some, some other college art museums have some Steinberg prints. Um, actually in the, there's a footnote where I give a list of all the other institutions that I know of that have prints um, from Steinberg. The National Gallery has some. Um, he, there was another um, friend of his who collected prints, um, whom he advised on prints and whom he sold some of his prints to. When she died, about two to 300 of those were bought by somebody else who then gave those prints um, to us. So that's how we go from his 3,200 to then an extra um, several hundred that entered our collection that all have his um, mat notes on them. So uh, almost everything that he had at the um, when he was ready to give his print collection away came to us. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Julie asks, did he require his students to make their own collections? Oh, um, not that I know of. Um, so, and I should say he taught at um, Hunter College. And um, so he taught in New York, but then for many years, um, he had a distinguished chair at the um, University of Pennsylvania. So he would commute to um, Philadelphia and teach there. Did he require his students to have prints? I don't think so. I think he required he did require them perhaps sometimes to take poses um, or to um, I don't know if he required them to draw. Um, and I do know that he taught um, using the collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art because um, I as I was going through his papers. I found a letter from a curator there saying, I think you left one of your prints in our collection. So I think he also brought his own prints to Philadelphia Museum and compared them with what um, <laughs> with what they had. So another kind of, yes, back in the day, those things are possible, but um, no longer. <laughs> I'm so fascinated. Market, sorry, I wanted to say the print market did change, right? So he, there is a moment he... He's collecting from the early 60s. It really peters out um, by the 80s. He's collecting a little bit up until 2000, but um, prices really started to change. And I think it just, even though his income also went up, I think it's just really hard to pay $1,000 for something that used to cost $2, <laughs> you know, and um, to kind of make that transition in your mind. Um, he did buy, um, the most expensive print he ever bought was by Durer, um, and it was about $4,500. So not an incredibly expensive print for Durer, but that was his upper price limit, um, seems to be, um, yeah. It's interesting kind of connecting with one of the questions that Aaron was asking about whether this is a model of scholarship that is accessible to us, that he does seem to have been focused on making materials accessible, right? To deposit most of the collection in a public institution um, rather than to sell it off back to the private collecting market, right? Or to, and to multiple public institutions. So it seems like democracy and accessibility was maybe a concern of his. Yes, I don't think, um, I mean, and he, the arrangement that was worked out with the University of Texas, I mean, it was uh, one of those sort of gift purchases, you know, it was lower than the market value, but he did receive um, funds for it. So um 
But I do think, yeah, there was a compelling argument made by our curator at the time, Jonathan Bober, to say, you know, this, it is such an important study collection. And, you know, I should also say, um, you know, there are print collectors who would only buy the best impressions of the best artists, and they would look at Steinberg's collection and, you know, you can critique it. There's a bunch of, <laughs> there's some fabulous impressions and there's some less less fabulous ones. I can't just look in our catalog and say, oh, he has these works. Great. Let's put those up on the wall. I have to look carefully it's like e, this, this has condition issues or this is kind of ratty tatty. Like, I don't know. <laughs> there has to be a really compelling reason to put this one out. Um, and that's fabulous for a university collection. Um, some of those ones I showed you that had holes in them or had squaring on them. I mean, many collectors at the time wouldn't have bought those. Um, whereas that's very instructive. So um his collection really is suited for a university, I would say, um, or for an institution definitely committed to kind of education and having a study room and a and a space where people can can look at them. And um, one of the um, participants on this call who had to hop off early, um, Adele Nelson, um, is a professor at UT. And um, during the pandemic, when resources were, you know, many research um, facilities at UT were closed, she and I worked out a... Um, a project for her class where students would come in one at a time wearing masks and we picked works from the Steinberg collection that were had mysteries associated with them like we didn't know who the artist was or it seemed to be an unfinished work or um, we didn't know who the subject was or you know and students did research projects on those so um, you know I, there's there's still lots of as I said there's lots of mysteries and lots of questions and, and research questions associated with this collection that um, it's great that it's at a university. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, if you could join me in thanking Holly for a wonderful book uh, and Aaron for uh, insightful questions uh, and a generous uh, discussion of the text as well. Um, a round of applause and thank yous in the chat. Um, note that up in the chat, there is a link where you can see a copy of Holly's book and pick that up if that's something you'd like to add to your own library. Um, and then note that our next Critical Bibliography book party is coming up on December 14th with more details to be announced across all of our various listservs. And that'll feature the scholar Megan Robb's project, Unstable Archives, the Transformation of a Bihari Mukal into an English Lady from 1758 to 1822, and she'll be in conversation with Yale Rice, who is a historian of Islamic art and architecture. Um, thank you, Holly. Thank you, Erin. And I hope everybody has a lovely day. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>